That was, that was pretty awesome, huh? Where's, where's Andrew at? There he is. Look at him. He's in camouflage. You can't see him. See that floating head back there? I love that guy. You guys excited? All right. John chapter 4, verse 14. If you want to click there, turn there. I still like to use a Bible. I mean, that's the Bible too, but I like this one as well because you can slap people with it. Just making sure you guys are awake and listening. Okay, so I've only done that once. I'll tell that story another week. Okay, so John, we're going to start in John chapter 7, but before we go there, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's not be like first service. We had to try twice, so let's just get it the first time. All right? All right, youth pastor? Yeah, okay, here we go. So the title of the message, you guys ready? Say Go. go. Okay, let's try that again. Say go. Grow. That was good. Say grow. grow. And say truly know. Truly know. Now, have any of you guys ever met a Christian or seen a Christian on TV or read a book about a Christian that truly inspires you? Anybody? Maybe it's your grandma, maybe it's your grandpa, your mom, but there's those people in your life that have marked you, right? Maybe you've read about them, you, you talk about them, and you think, Man, that person truly knows God, right? I have those people in my life that I've, I've read their books, D.L. Moody or Smith Wigglesworth or different ones that, that I've read about that I think, man, those people truly knew God. And, and I'm telling you that you can have that same relationship with God that they had. Now, it's going to look different. Your calling is different, but you can truly know God as they knew God. Okay, But if we never begin to go with what God has given us, we're never going to grow, and then we're never going to truly know who God is. Amen? Now, last service, we talked about LeBron James. Somebody shout out another NBA basketball player. Damian Lillard, I heard that. Praise God. He, uh, he plays for the Portland Trail Blazers. Any fans? No. Security, uh, security, remove this guy immediately. Go so he can grow and truly know that who's in charge around here. Who do you like? The Buckeyes. That's not even the NBA. That's the NFL. But we forgive you for that. Okay. So anyway, uh, let's talk to this section over here. Caleb, uh, tell me a NBA basketball player. LeBron James. Okay, here we are. We find our way back to LeBron James. So. They say that he's the most hated NBA basketball player, but he is still the king, and Space Jam 2 is going to be amazing. No? We forgive you, too. Okay, so my wife in the second row was excited to watch Space Jam 2. It's going to be fun. So LeBron James, we can know stats about him. We can know how many championships he's won. We can go on Google and understand that he's going to change his number from 23 to 6, right? We know information about LeBron James, but we've never met LeBron James, right? And there's also, there's a lot of people that are like, man, LeBron James, and they'll start like, I'm like, yeah, if he was sitting in front of you, would you have that attitude? Yes. He'd probably be like, will you sh sign my shoe, <laughs> right? Right? We, we, we form opinions about people that we don't even know, but... But, you know, I, I want you to know that there's a difference between knowing information about somebody and knowing somebody, right? I want to just, for a moment, jump onto that family meeting. Is that okay? I'm just going to be like the uncle that jumps in for a moment, raises my hand, right? Many people are like, well, I have the gift of discernment. It's the only gift I possess. I don't operate in the gift of faith or the gift of healing or the gift of miracles. I have been put on the earth to be a discerning Christian, which what you're saying is, is you don't like people, you're judgmental, and you don't know how to love anybody. Can we, can we talk about this for a minute? I have found that my discernment is normally off. Normally what you need to do when you're discerning something is go to the person and say, hey, um, I would like to get a coffee with you and get to know you before I judge you. Can I get an amen from somewhere beside the pastoral department? 
You do not discern all, nor know all, nor see all. You see in part. And oftentimes when you're discerning something, it is only the beginning of a conversation. So lean in. Amen. Okay, back to the message. Okay, here we go. That was free. It just popped out. So we don't want to be people that just know information about God. Like, do you understand that the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they knew the word better than us, right? But when the word became flesh and stood in front of them, they missed the word of God, actually to the point where they crucified him. I read a quote, I believe it's C.S. Lewis. He says, the devil is a way better theologian than you, and he's still the devil, Okay. Wow. Second service is getting a little bit hot fast. Here we go. So, so we need to understand that information alone does not bring transformation, right? It says that if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Truth in and of itself outside of being known doesn't set you free. And by the way, truth is not a text only. It's a person and his name is Jesus. And we need to be in relationship with the person of Jesus. So you can actually know him. Have a conversation with him. Talk to him by his spirit. Amen. And so we're going to look at this scripture. It says now in, in John 17, verse 14, now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And Jesus marveled saying, how do, and sorry, and the Jews marveled saying, how does this man know letters having never studied? Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine, say doctrine, or my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Now underline this, if anyone wills to do, say do, his will, not just listen, not just learn, but put into action to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. Right, we're not called to just be hearers of the word, but be, to be doers of the word. And today, we're going to talk about evangelism. Lock the doors. <laughs> Nobody run out. But before we get to evangelism, I want to talk about a few other um, instances. Well, actually, everything in the Christian life is meant to, you're, you're meant to learn and do. Or all you have is a theory, right? Let me say it this way. You can all of a sudden get a burden from the Holy Spirit to pray and you can go to Amazon and buy the best book on prayer and you can read that book and your heart can burn, right? And you're like, man, my heart is burning for prayer and you're, you're going to Pastor Stephen and saying, man, man, we got to talk about prayer and, and you're all pumped and hyped about prayer and you've never even prayed. <laughs> what I've learned is heartburn is invitation. Did you hear me? There's a, there's a heartburn that comes from the pizza you ate last night. And then there's a holy heartburn that comes from the Holy Spirit. Meaning, today when I'm speaking, your heart is going to burn. And you're going to say, I know that I'm called to that. That's what I was created for. But that burning in your heart is only an invitation to step into a reality and out of a theory. The world right now does not need your theory. The world needs the reality of the kingdom of God. This county needs the reality of the kingdom of God shown in it. It says the God in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, it says the God, little g, of this world has blinded unbelievers. Let lest the light of the gospel shine on them. And we are called to be light in darkness, full of the Holy Spirit. And we need to be activated in the things of God. But I'm telling you, it's, I was telling Saxton, my friend, in worship, I said, it's been a while, but I've been praying for the power of God to come upon my life. And the Lord says, power comes with a cost. I said, God, I will count the cost, but I want the power of God on my life so we can demonstrate that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And this is what the Holy Spirit said to me in worship. Then quit standing in a room and waiting for it. Get out there and I'll send it. I was like, yes, Lord. I'm going right after second service. It's going to be awesome. But I'm going to go after this thing. And I want to invite you also to run after this thing. It is not a, they're called, I'm not called. We're all called and we're all filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? 
Okay, so, yeah, I'm as excited as you are. That was awesome. Let's all clap with her. That's great. Okay, here we go. So before we jump in to talk about evangelism, let's talk about a few other things. Is that all right? Just so we can show that we don't want theory doctrine, we want a reality of the kingdom of God in our lives. Okay? Now in uh, Matthew 6, verse 3, it says, But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing that your charitable deed may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Now, Christian, I'm talking to you, Generation Church. It doesn't say if you, it says when you. It doesn't say when you read a book about it and think about it or watch a YouTube message on it or hear somebody preach about it. It says when you give, right? Not if, when, say when. If we're Christians, that's what we do. We are givers. Why? Because by nature, God, who gave his only begotten son, right? It's his nature to give. That's why when you give, you feel so amazing. Because you were created and designed by God to give. So when you give, there is an open reward that comes. Now, I shared a different testimony, but I got, I got a, a different one for today when it comes to giving. It was back years ago, probably 12 years ago, my wife and I went to Africa and we gave away a vehicle. Okay? We gave a vehicle away. Remember that green Saturn? Yeah. And uh, so we gave a vehicle away and we put into practice what God told us to do. It was a charitable deed to a friend who needed it. Fast forward to Dallas when we were there about a year ago, and I had, a, I had a, a moment where I realized we have one vehicle, and I need another vehicle. It's not a I want, I need another vehicle because I have friends coming into town. Actually, Andrew came and visited me and others, and I needed God to, to give me something, but I didn't have money for the insurance, nor the down payment, nor did I want that debt. So I'm sitting there in my prayer closet, and before God, I did this. And I went about my day. One hour later, a man calls me. Hey, Chris, um, I was just driving to Dallas, and I had this thought that you probably need to borrow my truck. It's just been sitting in my garage. Why don't you pick it up? I'll pay the insurance. Just put gas in it and use it as long as you would like. Now, see, to me, like, I'm thinking, praise God. I didn't want a car to pay the insurance, God literally set the whole thing up and I used it until I moved here. Amen. What am I saying? I'm saying there's a reality when it comes to giving. And I know some people, when it comes to money, they're like, are they talking about money in church? Yes, because God loves you. He understands that the number one thing that stresses you out is money. So he talks about it. So if we do what the word says, he then backs us up. Amen? Okay, let's move on to the next one. I could tell it was getting a little bit warm in the room. On to the next one. 6-6, six, six, Matthew 6, verse 6. I just want to show you that there is a reality that you can step into. Matthew 6, verse 6 says this. Let me find it. It says, but you... If you pray, nope, okay, we're, we're catching it. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to the Father who is in secret, in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. No secret place, no reward. Okay, now we have an entitled generation that's growing up that says, I'm gonna give mine. It doesn't work that way in the kingdom of God. There, is a, there are things that we do that open up a realm of the kingdom of God. And when we pray in secret, he rewards us openly. What does that look like? That means a couple weeks ago, I was at a gas station in Fort Worth. And if you guys ever just had somebody look at you kind of strange, and you're like, do I have a booger hanging out my nose? And you check and you're like, no, but you realize that they are actually attracted to the light of God that's coming off of you. 
Anybody ever had that experience? This lady was just kind of looking at me and, and I, I said, hey, do you know that Jesus loves you? And she says, that's what they told me. And I was like, foul demon named Legion, come out. No, I didn't do that. That would be awesome, but that's not how the story goes. So what I, what I said was, um, I didn't, okay, moving on, stop. We recovered from Andrew's video, we can recover from that. Okay, so I said, well, I want you to know this is why I believe, and I shared my testimony with her. And she goes, well, I believe in God, but I don't, I don't know what God to believe in, and I, I definitely know it's not that Jesus or that Jesus, and she was pretty upset. I said, well, let me tell you which one to believe in. The Lord spoke to me and told me that you have a bad neck and a bad shoulder, and he's going to heal it. How the... Did you know that Jesus, the one who you don't know if you believe in, who put me at this gas pump next to you, told me that so that you can believe in him. Can I see your hand? And she gave me her hand and right there at the gas pump, I prayed in Jesus name. And I said, when Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one seated at the right hand of the father that is interceding for you, heals you, you will no longer have to guess who is God. Amen. Now that doesn't happen unless you have a prayer life. So so what I'm hoping to do today is to take you from theory into a place where you're like, man, I need to go so I can grow. Because the moment you, and don't wait for tomorrow. Don't be like the, I'm, I'm telling on myself, Chelsea, I will start that diet tomorrow. Last, uh, last night, when I ate the hot dogs yesterday afternoon, when I ate the ice cream, can I hear an amen? And we live in a reality of I'll do that tomorrow. Don't start tomorrow. Start right now. If you start right now today, you're going to begin to grow today. Don't wait for tomorrow. Amen. Okay. So we see in prayer. Now let's look at another one in Matthew six, verse 16, Matthew six, verse 16. This one is not my favorite. It has to do with fasting. It says, uh, moreover, when you fast, by the way, fasting is not social media. That's called discipline. Try it sometime. It will change your life. Okay. And it doesn't have to do with media. Okay. It's food, but not Chick-fil-A. That is manna. We just connected. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. The translation loosely talked to Pastor Donnie about it. He'll clean it up for me. But manna means uh, the angel food, which is Chick-fil-A. Okay. Although in heaven, it's open on Sunday. Yes. Okay. Moving on. Wow. Here we go. All right. We're having fun because here comes a punch. It says, moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you're fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. What is the reward? It's, it looks like this. We're, we're in... Uh, Mississippi, myself and a few of my friends, somebody had gifted us a Ford Transit bus. It's a van. It's really cool. You should check it out. It's out there. We love it. It's like our gospel van. And, and we were driving in it, and I saw a family sitting out on, on, the, on the front porch, and I heard the Holy Spirit say, stop. So we stopped. I got out. I began to share with them, and they said, this girl is very demonized. Will you please talk to her? And I tried multiple times. I asked four or five times if I could pray for her. She said no. Her eyes were acting all funny and weird. And then finally we broke through and she gave her life to Jesus. She began, she received and was baptized in the Holy Spirit in that moment, began to pray in the Holy Spirit and was delivered from demons on her front porch. What, why do I say that? Jesus says some come out with prayer and fasting. I don't think he's talking about some demons coming out. I think he's talking about some unbelief. Meaning in that moment, I didn't go, oh, shoot, 
call Pastor Stephen for prayer backup. I'm going to fast for 35 seconds and step back into this moment. No, I was fasted. I was in alignment with heaven. And because I was in alignment with heaven, deliverance came. Because I don't have a theory called God is my deliverer. I have a deliverer named Jesus who's there in that present moment, filled me with the Holy Spirit to set her free. Guess what? She came to church the next day with her whole family. Come on, somebody. I, I hope... I hope that we're awakening something in you that, that you can go, man, and, and I know because we can, we can mistake the heart burn and, and the moments in worship and, and these things is the encounter with God. That is but only the invitation to step into more. I want to step into more. I want to step into more this week. I'm not saying that I've arrived. I'm saying I've just begun, and I'm so excited to see what God does this week. We, we were out on outreach, Saxton and I, and, and the crew, and, and, and Saxton and I saw these guys with a, with a bum foot, and Saxton said, can I pray for you? We asked how the pain was. He said there was pain there, and after Saxton prayed, he said this. He wasn't a churched young man. He, he didn't know. I, I love it when this happens. He goes, I felt pain leave my foot. I thought, come on, God, do it again. See, we don't want to have Jesus as a, a theory, as the healer. We want to have him manifest his power in Pinellas County. Amen? But what does that take? That takes all of us going so that we'll grow, so that we can truly know who God is. Amen? Does anybody want to begin to grow in God? I do. That's why you're here, right? Because we want to grow in God. Now, there's talking about evangelism, there are two major lies. There's many lies, but when it comes to evangelism, these are two of the main ones. The first one is, I'm not an evangelist. I'm the prayer person. I'm the worship person. I'm the door greeter. I'm the, I'm the kids ministry worker. I don't do that street evangelism thing. Now, I understand we all have different callings, but we're all called to be witnesses. Okay? We're all called to be witnesses. So, I'm not a street evangelist either. I'm a basketball evangelist, I'm a coffee shop evangelist, I'm a Walmart evangelist, and now by the grace of God, today I'm going to be a beach evangelist. Thank you, Florida, for checking that off my list. It's just actually, instead of being an evangelist, I'm in love with Jesus, and everywhere I go, I can't contain it. Like I'm walking out of Target yesterday, getting ready to have some hot dogs, and I see these people, and I'm like, oh, I just can't help myself. Fear. I got to be careful how I say this, but I want to, I want, I don't even know what fear is. Somebody once said to me, Chris, do you ever feel awkward sharing your faith with people? I said, oh no, there's something so beyond that, a place in the kingdom of God where you only feel awkward if you don't. I'm telling you there's more, fear is a spirit, and it wants to stop you, not just in evangelism, but in prayer, right? You begin to press in in your prayer life, and you begin to see results, and all of a sudden the enemy attacks, and you're like, well, if I go after God, then I'm going to hit this resistance. Stop it. It's a lie. Or fasting, you begin to fast, and, and you begin to hit opposition, and you're like, I don't know if I should do that again. Fear is not just evangelism. Fear is across the board on all things, but the Lord has not given you a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. So what happens is as believers, right, we go to Target and we're like, you, you see like a 95-year-old frail woman in a walker, and she's walking, and you're like, you hear the Lord say, go and talk to her, and you take your first step, and fear comes over you. And then you begin to look inside and go, oh my gosh, I'm so fearful, what's the matter with me? No, it's not in you. Christ is in you, the hope of glory. The enemy has sent a fiery dart and put a wall of fear in front of you. Uh, whenever I feel fear, I get excited and say, man, I'm going to crush hell today. And I step through that fear, which is a spirit, and we rescue people out of darkness. I need you to have your perspective change. Fear is not in you, believer. Christ is in you. And when you begin to understand that, like when you feel fear today when you're out, be like, no, 
that's not who I am. And step right through that. And I'll tell you what, things change. Amen? Amen. All right, so the other big lie is I'm not gifted, right? Don't raise your hand, but many of us have said that I'm, I'm not gifted. I'm not qualified, right? Let, let me say this. Some of the most gifted individuals become the most arrogant and the most proud individuals. This is why God takes the weak things and pours his spirit on them. That's why God takes Gideon's army from thousands to hundreds. That's why he took the smallest tribe. And that's why God works that way. So actually the very thing that you think disqualifies you is what qualifies you. And when you feel strong enough, you should be very scared. When you're like, man, I got this service. I'm anointed. I'm called by God. Watch out and duck. You're about ready to get taken out. But when you come in weak and humble and you say, God, I'm not qualified for this. I'm just a lump of clay. Fill me with your spirit. He will anoint you to change the world. That's actually what you see in front of you. I just come from a humble little town in Woodland, Washington. I'm a nobody. So God said, I'll make that guy a somebody because he's going to be one that actually leans in on me because he needs me. Like if you ask my wife, if she came up and shared for a moment, ask her about 16 years ago when I shared my faith or 16 years ago when I would share and she'd just sit there and go, oh, is this almost done yet? <laughs> like we've grown a lot over the years. We, we've become better communicators. We've, we, we've, we've seen God, you know, we, we went from praying for people at Vancouver Mall to praying for people in mosques in Iraq. That wasn't an, an overnight experience. That was years of obedience at Home Depot and Target and, and, and all these different places. And God building me truly understanding and knowing who he is. But church, if we don't start today, we're not going to know who he is. And, and like we said last week, you can be saved, be in love with Jesus, and be going to heaven, but absolutely you can miss some of what God has called you to do on earth, which is to fulfill the Great Commission, which is to preach the gospel and make disciples. And, and I, I, I believe today what I'm, what I'm here to do is, is to say, will you commit to saying, Jesus, I'm going to begin to go? I said this last week about Reinhard Bonnke. He said, if you have a track athlete and you put that track athlete in your home and he's sitting there, you don't see his power. But if you take that track athlete outside and you say, run, you're going to see the power in that athlete. Many of us as Christians, me included at times, I sit and I'm waiting for the power of God to come so I'll go. When I feel bold, when I, when I feel compassion, when I this or when I that, and I, I want you to know that you may not feel it until you're in the field. You may not feel it until you step out, but I'll tell you what, when you step out, he will meet you and he'll back you. He backed me this week. And he's going to continue to back me because I step out in obedience. But if we don't go, we're not going to grow. So you are called by God to be a witness. You may not be an evangelist. And you are gifted. Why? Because you have the gift of the Holy Spirit. When, whenever you say, I'm not gifted, you, you've been gifted with the capital H Holy, capital S Spirit. You've been gifted the greatest gift of all time. The Holy Spirit of God is in you. You are more gifted than you will ever fully understand. And you're going to be understanding how gifted you are for the rest of your life into eternity. You have been gifted God's Spirit on the inside of you. Oh, you're gifted. Right? So I, I want to explain something to you. The whole, so the Father has gifts. When you were born... Before repentance, as a sinner, you had hardwired gifts from the Father. That's why you look at some business people and they're exploding with wealth and, and they're gifted in their field. That's because God created them to thrive in that area. Or you look at somebody who doesn't use their voice to honor God, but they're on major platforms and they have amazing gifts with music. God gave them that gift, the Father, when they were created. 
Then you have the gifts of Jesus, and the gifts of Jesus are the evangelist, the pastor, the prophet, the evangelist, and the teacher. The gifts of Jesus are the fivefold ministry to the body of Christ to encourage you and to equip you to change the world. And then you have the Holy Spirit's gifts. And that's in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7 through 10, where it talks about the nine manifestation gifts of the Holy Spirit. I call those the Christian fundamentals, right? Now, we like playing basketball, right, Caleb? We, we love basketball, and, and we talk about it all the time. And, but let's say that Caleb is an amazing three-point shooter, which he is, just not that one time. But... Uh, but let's say that he's an amazing corner three-point shooter, okay? But he can't dribble. He's not athletic at all. He can't play defense. You can be like, none of this is true. Stop it, stop it. Um, you're going to be like, well, Stephen can make threes 50% of the time to your 70%, but he can play defense and he can run. So I'm going to pick Stephen over Caleb. Amen which based on the last performance, I might. Okay, so anyway, um, don't let him preach for the next six months because it's coming back my way. But anyway, edification. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is, is that we need to be well-rounded Christians, right? And so there's people like, the word of knowledge gift is my gift. It's mine. And I take ownership of it, but word of wisdom, I never function in that gift. That's your gift. No, we're, we're gifted with the Holy Spirit and whatever gift you need is gonna come to the surface the moment that you need it. But the reality is, is that you have giftings that I don't have that are stronger in you than in me, so we need each other. Like if we need to sing a song unto the Lord, get me off the stage and get Kiyashi up here immediately and we will go to the third heaven. So what I want you to see is though you will not see the manifestation gifts of the Holy Spirit unless you go and begin to grow in them. I'll never forget the first time that I, that I got a word of knowledge. It was in a, in a place called Pro Caliber. It's a, it's a dirt bike store. I was there with Chelsea and it was the first time I ever got a word of knowledge and I was standing there and I felt a literal hand go into my back and pull out of my back. I turned around and nobody was there. And I saw a guy across the way and I went over and I said, excuse me, um, by chance do you have trouble with your back? He goes, how the blank did you know that? Oh my gosh, it works. <laughs> I prayed for him and God healed him. It was amazing. It was, it was incredible and, and it started a journey for me and now actually it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Why? Because he always wants you to call home. Lord, was that you? Yeah, why don't you call home? So like I'm constantly connected with Holy Spirit everywhere we go. That's why now when we went out on outreach on Thursday, we're walking through Dick's Sports, and, we're, and I see a guy just corner of my eye, right, Matthew? I said, that guy's got a bad neck. Let's go. And so we start running. We chase him down. Hey, this might sound really crazy, but you have a bad neck, and Jesus is going to heal you. And he goes, whoa. And the whole atmosphere changes. Did it not? It did. Can I pray for you? He puts his hand in my hand and we begin to pray for him. Now I know his voice. But I, I had to begin somewhere. And I'm telling you, church, that you need to begin to ask God to speak to you. You need to begin to go and take risk. And when you begin to go, you'll begin to grow. And then you'll find yourself in a van in the middle of Baghdad, cruising down a street, going, what the heck am I doing here? Walking into a mosque, calling out a word of knowledge, seeing a person in the third row fall out into the power of God, stand up completely healed, see a couple hundred people respond to the gospel and have men in the back of the mosque that are mocking you say, what is happening? Why are my hands on fire? And the man that bring us go, your hands are on fire because that's the Holy Spirit. And you see Muslim men lay hands on Muslim men in the name of Jesus and see them get healed. That doesn't happen overnight. That's 16 years of going and growing that causes you to truly know God. And that's why I'm getting on an airplane, not this Monday, but next. And I'm flying to that nation and I'm going to tell them and boldly proclaim who God is because I've not just heard about it, but I've seen it. 
And I have a conviction that when I go on outreach this week, God's going to move because I've not just heard about it or read about it or heard somebody else's story, but I saw it this week. And I'm asking you, Generation Church, will you join that journey? Don't you want to be this way? Don't you want to be so confident? Don't you want to be the person that people call and say, you've got to come and pray for me? I need you to pray for me because when you pray, the power of God moves through your life. That's not just a gift that comes on you. That's something that's cultivated through relationship with the Holy Spirit, through prayer and fasting and giving. I'm telling you guys, there is such an open door of invitation from Holy Spirit, and that's why your heart's burning. You're saying, that's me. But just like the diet that we're gonna start tomorrow that gets pushed off to next week and then next month, we cannot be people that says, I'll start that tomorrow. We gotta start today. What does that look like practically? It's simple. It looks like you walking out of this church and saying, I'm gonna pray today. I'm going to set my alarm clock just five minutes earlier. And before I leave, I'm going to get on my knee and I'm going to say, Jesus, I love you. Use my life today. What does it look like? It looks like you going to lunch and having that $5 and walking over to the people that you know that needs it and handing them that $5 and saying, can I pray for you? What's it looks like? Maybe it looks like next week you saying, you know what? I'm desperate for change in my life. I'm going to give up lunch and I'm going to sit in my car at work and I'm going to pray. And I'm going to ask God to feed me because we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And I need a word from God in this season. Maybe it looks like you committing and saying once a day, once a day, even if I get home and I'm sitting there and I'm watching TV and the Holy Spirit reminds me that I didn't do it, I'm going to get up, get in my car, drive to Target, and just tell one person about Jesus. I don't know what it looks like for you, but it looks like something. It looks like taking action. It looks like whatever it is that Jesus is, is beginning to speak to you right now, whatever he's highlighting to you, put evangelism off to the side. Let's just put that over here for a moment. Whatever he's saying to you to do, to take from theory to reality, step into it today. There might be somebody in here that needs to skip lunch today. I don't know. But I'm telling you, let's as a family say, Jesus, we're going to move from theory to reality. Amen? Amen. I had a really funny story, but I don't have time to share it. So just go back and watch first service. It's really funny. I'll I'll tell it another time. What I want you to see in in, in closing is this, and if the band can come up, I want you to see something. And we're going to start in Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, verse 6. Because I want to give you a biblical um, picture of of how this works. You see Peter and John going up to the gate called Beautiful. It says, but Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. That is a bold statement. What does that look like this week? That looks like Saxton and I and Tyrone Mall saying, we're going to pray for your foot and we're going to believe God that he's going to heal it. And then that looks like us saying, not only that, but once we prayed, we didn't just go be healed and then run away. We stood there and we said, how's it feel? And we took that awkward moment for him to say, I didn't feel anything. But he said, no, man, I felt the pain leave. That's what that looks like in 2021. That's what it looks like. And you can step into that same thing today. So you see that they went out and they believed God. And I love that they prayed specifically, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And and we know that when they put into action what God had told them to do, they had amazing fruit. In Acts 4, 19 So once that miracle happened, they got in trouble, right? Because the Pharisees, they did not like that. So they came because what was happening was they were stealing 
their people, their image. Like, and that, that's what you see with Jesus. Is, and actually, every time that Jesus got into a debate or a conversations with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and every time you would see him ask questions and they would be silenced, right? It said that, that they would turn and they'd walk away. In, in one passage, when he writes in the dust, it said they walked away from the oldest to the youngest. Every time Jesus silenced them, he shamed them in their culture. You follow me? He took their honor. That's not what he was trying to do. He was trying to reveal that he was God, but they were so interested in people looking to them. that They're like, we may even believe that he is, but I need to make sure that people look at me a certain way. So that's why, one of the reasons why, they had to publicly execute him because they wanted to get their honor back. There's, it's Jesus' cross. Ultimately, he came to die on that cross. But what motivated them was he so many times shut us down that we have to publicly crucify him to get our honor back. How many times do we try to silence the voice of the Holy Spirit in our life to keep our honor and dignity? Think about it. Well, I don't know if I want to do that because they might look at me weird. That's going to make me not look. I lost that a long time ago. I'm a Jesus freak. I am. I'm. I've lost my mind and I've entered into the mind of Christ. I don't care anymore and I'll tell you what, it is a very good feeling to be set free from yourself. They needed freedom, it's a very similar freedom that we need this day. So you see that they're trying to stop them and this is what the boy said, but Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what happened. So when they acted in obedience, they saw fruit, and in response, they personally grew. They said, listen, we've not only heard, but we have seen. So they grew in godliness. There was a confidence that came in them that maybe they didn't have before. It was like, wow, this thing works. This is amazing. We saw Jesus do it. We took part in it, but now we're doing it. And there's a confidence that caused them to say, whether it's right, you choose, but I'm going to serve God. That's why we tell our kids, and even I was talking to Ellie yesterday, she, she said, Daddy, are, are you maybe going to die in the Middle East? The chances of that happening are very, 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 very small. But this is why we say, listen, honey, I need you to understand some, something. If Daddy gets kidnapped by ISIS and they murder me, the world's going to say, Daddy made a mistake. But we know that somebody had to tell ISIS. So it'll be all over in the news, radical, crazy man goes to the Middle East and dies in the hands of ISIS, and little Ellie will go, but somebody had to tell him. Think about Paul. He went on a journey to die in Rome. The prophets were tying him up, saying, this is going to happen to you, and he goes, absolutely it is. I've lost my life and I've entered into his. So you see that they grew in boldness. They truly believed. And then in Acts 4 verse 23, if you guys will stand with me, in Acts 4 verse 23, it says when they, when they were released, it says this, they went to their friends. Right? So, hey Saxton, come, come stand by me real quick as we, as we close this. I want you to see something. Saxton and I had a public victory on Thursday. We saw a young man's ankle be restored in Jesus' name. 
but our victory now becomes your victory and now you are mutually encouraged as we are listen to what it says it says they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them and when they heard it they lifted up their voices together to God and said sovereign Lord so their victory Peter and John's victory became the people's victory and they begin to praise God and they begin to believe that they could do it you can sit down they begin to believe that they could do it so we're here, right? And, and we may appear to be giants in faith. We're not. We're weak men dependent upon the Holy Ghost. Every day of my life, I lay on my face and I say, God, would you just do it again? But you may look at us and think, man, these guys are like, wow. No, we're not. I'm telling you that what we saw at Tyrone Mall, you can see at Tyrone Mall. I'm saying that we can take a city if we want a city because Pastor Stephen said that God spoke to him in joy and Pastor Donnie and said that this county is theirs. But we've gotta be activated. We've got to step into this thing. So if you're here and, and then you see that they pray and the place where they prayed was shaken. And then in Acts 4 verse 32, it says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Meaning when they stepped out in faith, they grew in boldness and knowing who God was. And then when they truly knew who God was, they truly came into unity. And it was exactly what Pastor Stephen was talking about today. You will have a hard time complaining about the color of a wall in kids care when you see blind eyes open in first service. You'll have a hard time being offended at a pastor when they walk by you and didn't see you and didn't smile when you see somebody completely restored at the altar and demons come out of them. I'm telling you guys, we're moving into a season of unity, but it's going to take all of us going and growing and truly knowing. If you're in this room and you're saying, today, I am choosing to go with God, I want you to put your hands up over your head all over the room. Father, I thank you, Lord, as, as the worship team begins to play, I thank you, Holy Spirit, that by your Spirit, you would come upon them right now, Lord, that it's not by strength, it's not by power, might or power, it's by your Spirit. And God, I pray that there would be a release of the Holy Spirit in this room, God. When it comes to prayer, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come on people and drive them into their prayer closet. When it comes to fasting, Lord, come by your spirit and cause people to begin to fast. When it comes, Father, to giving, I pray that supernatural giving will hit this place that nobody would be in need. Father, when it comes to evangelism, I pray that you would push people past the spirit of fear into a place where they encounter the kingdom of God daily. God, I pray that you would come and mark this church with your power and your presence. Father, you spoke to us and said that we are moving into a summer of miracles. And I declare over this congregation and this church, online and in person, that you will experience the miracles of God. You will see healing, signs, wonders, and miracles in 2021. God, you spoke that religion was going to move out of the way and power was going to come into focus. You spoke and said unbelief was going to move out of the way and that faith was going to rise up. You spoke and said anxiety was going to be cast down and that peace was going to rule and reign in this city. If you pray in the Holy Spirit, I want you to begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. I want you to begin to intercede. If you don't, just begin to pray, Jesus, come mark this church. Come and have your way. Father, right now we declare that we will take this city in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray that this week as we go on outreach, as we go about our day, God, that we will see hundreds, if not thousands, come into your kingdom. Father, we say, here we are, send us. We say, God, remove every idol, remove every hindrance, and come and have your way in our families. Have your way in our marriages. Have your way in our church. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. We lift up the name above all names, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. We lift him up just right now. Begin to lift up the name of Jesus. We lift up your name. You rule. You reign. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord in Pinellas County. We declare it. Let it be in 
in Jesus' name.